Well, for those of you who haven't figured out, I'm the guy who's controversial then. And so uh, if you don't know me, you'll remember me after this talk, I promise. Of course, you all know the story of the five blind men and the elephant. Uh, and what it, that whole story is about is if you feel the trunk of the elephant, it's a different story than if you feel his leg. When Dr. Warner showed you that picture, he put one slant on it, <clears throat> but I have a slightly different slant. And that is, is that th that was a little bit after I first hid when I heard that he wanted me to talk, because I knew I'd get myself into trouble. <laughs> and he then got me to give this talk by trying to threaten to kill me. <laughs> So it's all in perception. Talking about perception. Today we're not going to talk about survival differences of five months or the difference between five months and 11 months. We're going to be talking about survival differences of five years, 10 years, and 20 years, which is what we think where we want to take this disease from a disease that's an acute cancer and make it into a chronic disease like diabetes. So to begin with, I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to flip back and forth trying to compare and contrast carcinoids and gut-based tumors with pancreatic-based tumors. You've heard that there are differences in response today. Well, where do they come from? Well, the, the ones in the pancreas came from neuroendocrine stem cells, just like the ones from the guts. The ones that go to the pancreas and the duodenum, they make peptides generally. And those peptides are things like somatostatin that we heard about, things that you know every day about, like insulin, or the, the peptide that, that is the opposite of insulin. Insulin lowers your blood sugar, makes you use blood sugar. Glucagon raises your blood sugar, makes you store it, in, in cells uh, or release it from cells so you can use it. There are other kinds of cells in the, in the pancreas, those that make pancreatic polypeptide, those that make things like intestinal, a VIP or a vasoactive intestinal peptide. And all of these things have individual actions. VIP makes you put motility to the bowel, makes you put fluid in the bowel, and it, it's side effect of having too much VIP is you have diarrhea. Somatostatin, on the other hand, counteracts the relationship of VIP to the, the colon or the small bowel. If you have a Kolchinsky cell, that is a cell that makes amines, your tumor develops along the line of a carcinoid or a gut type based tumor. They are either non-secretory or if they secrete, it depends where they are in your body, what they secrete. There are four gut lesions, like in the thymus and the, in the lung, that secrete histamine, bradykinin, and those kinds of things. And then the gut-based tumors tend to secrete serotonin. A whole different kind of cells that none of us have talked about today, but occasionally you'll hear about, are things that go to the adrenal gland or the thyroid in the thyroid, they become medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. And in the adrenal gland, they become pheochromocytomas. Sort of brothers in crime, as it were, to carcinoids or islet cells of the pancreas. Well, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, uh, sort of as I was thinking about how to give this talk, it, it uh, came to me that Dr. Wallen was from Hollywood. So he would know all about this. There is the Mr. Lucky. You, you have to be as old as me to know who Mr. Lucky was. But <laughs> there's the Mr. Lucky sort of gambler stumble on an approach. There's the Marcus Welby approach where you don't know anything about neuroendocrine tumors, but a guy comes in with diarrhea, and you remember once upon a time hearing the word carcinoid, so you say carcinoid. Or there's the house approach, which is, you don't know what it is, but you do every imaginable test, put them on every imaginable therapy, and then finally, just before the show ends, <coughs> or the patient dies in this case, 
uh, you figure out what's wrong. But the key to all of this is suspicion. The, the, in the old days, we used to hear time and time again that the, the, the onset of symptoms till the correct diagnosis was made was a decade or more. And I'll show you that this group, because you're internet literate, maybe has brought that down to less than two years. Let's th talk about some things at a basic level. When you're getting diagnosed early on, you'll have tumor that's been put in formalin to be fixed, it's cut on the glass slides, and then it's stained for various and sundry things. A lot of times, a person will read, my tumor stains positive for gas. I know what I got, I have a gastronoma. Or it says, my tumor stains positive for VIP. Hot damn, I know what's wrong. My diarrhea is due to VIP, I have a VIPoma. Notice the inequality sign in the middle. Having it stain on the tumor doesn't mean it gets in your blood. Stuff can be made inside the tumor and never released from the tumor so that it is what gets in your blood that counts. What else do you need to know? Well, tumors should be stained for things like KI-67. KI-67 asks the question, what percent of the cells of my tumor are actively dividing at the time that it was put on glass? You need to do things like chromogranin A. Chromogranin A, remember we use all the time as a blood marker, but chromogranin A is made by the cells. It's part of a big family called the Granin family. And the Granin family says, you take the thing that's about the size of the Goodyear blimp, and that's chromogranin. The wheel on the Goodyear blimp is pancreas statin, but it's part of the blimp. So part of the chromogranin molecule, when it gets chopped up, one of the little parts is pancreas statin, and we'll talk about that a little later. The other marker that we do use is synaptophysin. And the, the chromogranin and the synaptophysin staining together We'll talk about and how, what it means to be differentiated. How much do you look like your brother or sister or mom or dad? And then the final thing that is now just experimental that I hope the next time I come back and give this talk will be commercially available all over the United States are somatostatin receptor subtype 2 and subtype 1 and subtype 5 stains. Dr. Warner and Dr. Uh, uh, Wallen talked about pasreotide, or the SOM230, or the, the somatostatin analog that stained more than one kind of receptor. That only works if you got the receptor. It doesn't make sense if you don't have a type 1 or a type 5 receptor to go on a drug that binds predominantly to type 1 and type 5 receptor. So hopefully as we go along this era of personalized medicine, the more I can do to your tumor, the less I can do to you. And that is a major advantage. KI-67, there are usually three grades that you've heard about since you were a newbie with the carcinoids. Typical, intermediate, and atypical. And those now in the, in the World Health Organization are called G1, G2, and G3. And so, those are a KI-67 of less than 2%, 3 to 20% is intermediate, and then the guys who are the bad guys are the atypicals greater than 20%. The chromogranin and the synaptophysin, we do what are called quantitative chromogranin and synaptophysin. If you look at 90% of the pathology sheets that, that you guys have in the room, it'll say, it's positive or negative. We take it one step further. We ask what percent of the cells have an intensity of three plus, two plus, or one plus? And then we can, we can look at that. The lessons we've learned from histology, what can you look at under glass? Is the most important thing is to have a pathologist who you work with on a day in and day out basis. KI-67 is most important indicator of clinical behavior. Chromogranin is the best indicator of 
of how well your tumor looks like the cells it was supposed to have come from. And why is that important? The more differentiated your tumor is, the more it looks like its brothers and sisters that it sprung from, the better it behaves. And synaptophysin we use only as a tiebreaker. Well, we talked about personalized, and there was actually a question about personalized care and what one does to these tumors. And, and the answer is, is really critical. And that is, when we take out a piece of tissue, when we take out a primary tumor, and you have lymph node metastasis and liver metastasis, there are many of you in this room that have your primary and your lymph nodes intact, but they did a needle biopsy of your liver. And what I'm going to show you later in this talk is that if you take all three pieces of tumor out and you compare them side by side, same pathologist, same technician, same day read, that your, your primary tumor, your lymph node, and your liver met aren't even from the same planet. So if you have a therapy that is based just on one kind of tissue, you may go down the wrong pathway. Things that we do is we tend to send, sell, uh, or send these tumor cells off for a bunch of different analysis. Sometimes we don't use that information, but sometimes it's critical, like in cases where you have an atypical or a high KI-67 or rapidly proliferating tumor, we use the, the in vitro test tube data to pick the chemotherapy that we're going to tra treat it with. The angiogenic index, there are two stains called CD31 and factor VIII that tell you how many blood vessels, as the, the pathologist looks at the slide, it's called a high-powered field, how many blood vessels are there per high-powered field? But you have to have a dedicated pathologist. He has to cruise the whole slide, look at maybe a thousand high-powered fields to pick the ones that he's going to count, because you want to pick the hot spots, not the, the, the places that are low spots. And this is really important. The things that you heard about today that Dr. Wallen said are hot tickets. RAD001, the Sutent PTK protein tyrosine kinase type drugs, all work by inhibiting blood vessel growth and maybe they work also by inhibiting tumor cells. But a major part of how they work is by stopping blood vessels from growing and feeding the tumor. For islet cell tumors, you, the things that you need to know is that it takes you a, a, an initial screen of all kinds of peptides for you to know which ones to use in the future time to follow your tumor. In other words, pre-op, you draw a, tube, a set of tube of bloods and you send it for gastrin, glucagon, VIP, substance P, neurotensin, a, a PP, ACTH, all the things that I listed. And maybe only one thing comes back positive. But that is the thing three months post-op, you're going to want to look for to see if it goes down to normal and then come back up. If you go for a while and you have no reoccurrence and then suddenly you start to develop symptoms, you go back to the start again and screen all of these things. For the blood tests for carcinoid, chromogranin, pancreastatin, and neurokinin A, you're going to say probably since many of you are from New York, what in the hell is neurokinin A? I've never heard about neurokinin A. The reason is, is because the, the one company that really al allows you to get accurate neurokinin A has been fighting with the state of New York about their licensure. That apparently is getting solved, so neurokinin A will be available in New York from ISI, as will pancreastatin. Occasionally, for people with poor, poor gut tumors, we use substance P, but 5-HIA the 24-hour urine test for carcinoid 
if you have flushing or wheezing or diarrhea, you have the syndrome, 5-HIA is the key test. Richard and his, his uh, wife Monica were the people who really made the list of all the things that you need to stay off of for three days before you do the 5-HIA test. <clears throat> One of the things you got to know is Joe's House of Discount Laboratories <laughs> ain't the place you want to be sending things that you're basing therapeutic decisions on. Not all labs are the same, and, and, and so I'm going to give you some examples today. This is the old Quest assay and the ISI assay for uh, chromogranin A. Now, for anybody who knows Quest, they've now changed their assay again for the third time in like five years, and the, it's not the normal of 36 anymore, now it's normal less than 15. But this was when the ISI and the Quest assay, the red dots and the green dots essentially overlapped. Whether the value was low, whether the value was high, ISI and Quest analysis told you the same thing. Let's talk about chromogranin assays. Mayo Clinic, 225. ARUP, 5. ISI, 36.5. Quest, 15. All of these are, are different assays, and if your last time your assay was done was 225 at Mayo, it's normal, and today it's 5 at ARUP, you didn't get better, it's just you, you still have a normal chromogranin, this time it's done by ARUP. How do you fix this problem? You stick with one lab, and you make sure it's a reputable lab that has validated their assay, by doing these kinds of things and use that lab every time. What about which markers are the, the, the most sensitive? And this assumes that you know where your primary is. This is talking about people who have mid-gut primaries in either the small bowel, the jejunum, or the ileum. And this is a patient, as you can see, the, the pancreastatin, the black line up above, starts to go up. We operate on the patient, it comes down and the patient then develops metastatic disease. But notice the, the 5-HI and the chromogranin on the bottom are really very, very flat, while the pancreastatin is much better at telling us the volume of the, of the tumor. What else? Well, pancreastatin ISI versus Ohio State. When Dr. Odoricio was originally at Ohio State, he created the pancreastatin assay. He raised the antibody himself, and he later used that antibody uh, in many, many clinical studies. ISI developed a pancreastatin, and it seemed to be a little bit more sensitive, but when we did what's called split tube testing, we draw a tube of blood out of your arm, we spin it, we separate off the, the plasma, we divide the plasma into two tubes. One we send to ISI, the other one we send to Ohio State. Notice that they're identical, except one curve is always higher than the other. And so that means when you get an Ohio State value and, a, and an ISI value, they'll be parallel, but not the same. You divide the Ohio State value by five, and you get ISI. You can't do that with the new one from the, the discount laboratory, which I think is, is Cambridge Biomedical Research Institute. I can only tell you that we cannot translate the neurokinins of the pancreastatins from that laboratory into either Ohio State values or as ISI values. Well, does making a monitoring neurokinin A make a difference? And this is a really important question if you, if you have a mid-gut carcinoid. Dr. Ardell at the Belfast Royal Infirmary in Belfast, Northern Ireland, developed the, the neurokinin assay. And what she found was, is there are three groups of people. Group one, your value never went over 50. Group two, your value went over 50. She realized that you were in trouble and did an acute change in therapy that brought you back under 50. 
And then there are the people who went over 50 and she couldn't get them back. If you went over 50 and she couldn't get you back, 87% of those people were dead in three years. If she could get you back, 100% of those people are still alive. So we asked the question, let's not talk about neurokinin from the, the time we drew your first neurokinin, because in the United States that could only be two years. Let's ask the question, does neurokinin help define what kind of tumor you have? And does it change your, your five year and 10 year survival? if you have an elevated neurokinin A. First of all, let's, let's look at how good the US neurokinin assay, i.e. the ISI assay, is compared to Belfast, Northern Ireland. In this case, ISI made up a set of tubes, 100 tubes, and assayed them, and sent those 100 tubes on to Belfast, Northern Ireland. As you can tell, it's a straight line. They gave a, essentially identical response. Dr. Ardell did exactly the same thing. She made up a set of tubes. She assayed them in her laboratory, which has a totally different assay that requires extraction of the plasma before they do the assay. And then she sent those extracted plasmas, FedEx to California, to be done by ISI. This is the kind of stuff that you can't get from the discount laboratories you can't compare this with the people who, who have the long-term survival data. And as you can see, again, there's a very good correlation between these two assays, one in Ireland and one in California. Now, <clears throat> what about our thing? Well, we started out with 400 people who had metastatic neuroendocrine tumors of the small bowel. 148 of those people had never been over 50 on their neurokinin, and their median survival was 275 months. Their five-year survival was 97%, and their 10-year survival was 94%. So guys, that says that, and every one of these people had metastatic disease. 94% of these people are alive at 10 years. That's an incredibly high value. If you went over 50 and we couldn't bring you back, there were 20 of those, the median survival was only 145 months. And the difference is 130 months. That's over 10 years. That is a huge difference. And you've got to consider that this assay has only been around for about four years. So let's look at the survival curve. These are the survival curves. The red line, never over 50, and the green line, which doesn't show up very well, I apologize, is went over 50 and we couldn't get you back. Again, we have a, another group of patients that we haven't talked about. What about if we take, you go over 50 and we say, uh-oh, you're in trouble, we gotta do something quick to get you back, 100% of those people are still alive. So you can go over 50 without a penalty in your survival if you recognize it and get a change in therapy immediately. A lot of what you heard today is somatostatin and how somatostatin works. Remember, somatostatin binds to the receptor, which is the yellow part. The yellow part then turns on the green part, which is the, uh, called the, uh, the G protein. The G protein is, is sort of like a light switch. When you turn on the G protein or turn off the G protein, certain pathways light up or don't light up. And that has to do with the secretory vesicles and the release of, of peptides or hormones. But as you heard today by Dr. Wallen, it also says something to do about the basics. And the basics are, do cells grow faster or slower in the presence of somatostatin analogs? And the answer is they grow clearly very much slower. What defines that is how many of the receptors are bound at any one time. If I ask you to look around this room and we're gonna turn out all the uh, ceiling lights and I say, how many uh, places can we plug in lamps? 
that you can count pretty quickly how many receptors there are in this room. How much light I can get into this room is how many receptors there are and how big is the light that I put in one receptor. For somatostatin receptor subtype 2, which is the one you need to know about, type 1 and type 5, we don't really know diddly squat about those receptors. But type 2 receptors, we know a bunch about, and they're the ones that you want to get every one of them saturated that you can. It is commonly uh, assumed there is a, a special word, it's called the KD, and that's the concentration of drug that saturates half your receptors. For somatostatin receptor subtype 2, that's 10 to the minus 9 molar, or about 1,000 picograms per mil in the blood test. 30 milligrams of LAR, about 5,000, 60 milligrams, usually in the 7,500 to 10,000 range, but women have higher blood levels than men if they weigh the same and have the same body mass index. And so height, weight, sex, and body mass index all screw up your blood values. The bigger you are, the more drug it takes to saturate your blood. Somatulene Depot, 120 milligrams every two weeks, gets you up near the 10,000 mark. Why do we want to saturate your receptors? It ought to maximize your symptom control. It ought to minimize wasted drug, because if I put 10 times more than, than saturates the receptor, it's just wasted. It ought to maximize your anti-tumor effect. This is work done by Roberto Denisi from Italy on HUVEX cells, human umbilical vein endothelial cells. These are blood vessel cells. And what he showed was, as you increase the amount of octreotide, the, the number of cells that are, stay alive go down and down and down. But then if you go even higher, out here, the cotton picking cells start to regrow and the effect is lost. And the guy who figured that out is a gentleman from Los Angeles named Shlomo Melmud. And what Dr. Melmud showed was that as you bind a type 2 receptor, you progressively inhibit and then once you saturated type 2 receptor, type 5 starts to, recept, uh, to saturate, and type 5 turns off type 2. So now we understand why too much octreotide is equally bad as too little octreotide. And we've seen this study a thousand times today. Promid, 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 promid. Why is it so important? Because for the first time, we, we got clear-cut evidence that octreotide blocks tumor growth. But did they go far enough? They picked 30 milligrams. Why? Because that's what, it's, uh, that's what the FDA has approved, 30 milligrams. What's the average dose of octreotide LAR in the United States today? 42 milligrams a day, or 42 milligrams a month. Notice that is way higher than 30 milligrams. And, that, and notice when Dr. Wallen was talking about the new passreotide study, they were going to use 40 milligrams, that's where they came up with that. The key question is, does higher doses, i.e. higher blood levels, have an increase over the PROMED study? So if 30 is good, is a blood level greater than 5,000, no matter what dose it takes, even better? Prospective stru a study from, 19, from 2004 today. 2004 is important because before that, you couldn't commercially uh, uh, measure octreotide levels. The number of females and males were percentage-wise the same in both studies. The people were about the same. And the dose that it took, less than 5,000, was 37 a month. And the greater than 5,000 was 62 milligrams a month. But what about survival? Does it make a difference if your blood levels are measured and they're higher? And the answer is, look what happens when the blood test becomes available and now we can make a difference by choosing a higher blood level or a lesser blood level. An acute split 
and the median survival is 151 months if you're the green line and 275 months if you're the red line. More drug makes a difference. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about one of the, the points that were brought up in the earlier talks. And that is, have you ever wondered why any therapy that we talk about doesn't cure folks? Even if we talk about, we're gonna test this drug or test that drug or test this tumor or test that tumor, why is that? And, and the answer may be that your primary tumor, your lymph node and your liver met are really three different tumors with three different sets of characteristics. It may be like my children. <laughs> My son is 6'3", my daughter is 5'10", and my stepdaughter is 5 foot. You know, they're all part of the family, but they all look like different kids, and you can clearly see that they, they have uh, different characteristics. And, and the same clothes wouldn't fit all three. The same therapy doesn't necessarily fit your primary, your lymph node, or your liver. But can you prove that? Well, Dan Van Hoff, who is now at the University of Arizona, was the guy who did invented drug resistance testing. And what he did was he took pairs of tumor, pairs, uh, pieces of tumor, two places in the same primary, primary to node, primary to liver met, liver met to node, et cetera. If you looked at the two areas of the primary tumor, he had 12 of those, 29 pairs of primary versus met, and 45 pairs of met versus met inside the primary tumor. So if you take one tumor and you compare it multiple sites in the primary, you do pretty well. But if you compare the primary to the lymph node or the primary to liver met, notice that that didn't work. That doesn't give you the same profile. So if you use the same chemotherapy, on your primary and on your metastasis, or one met you look at over here and you test it, and then you use that to test this met or treat this met, you're gonna go down on flames. So we, we have a philosophy. We're very aggressive surgically. We resect primary tumors. We try to get rid of uh, lymph node metastasis, and we try to decide to reduce or, or get rid of organ metastasis. The idea is, is we're gonna test all of these things because we think that by testing all of them we get more information than we do by one. But again, can you prove it? Don't tell me about some pharmaceutical study. Tell me about can, can you do the prospectives trial yourself? So who wins a chess game? If you're, if you're Boris Spatsky or Bobby Fischer and you're playing Gene Waldering, you can beat me with one half of your brain tied behind your back. Why? Because Gene Waldering is thinking about one step. What step am I going to do next? Whereas Bobby Fischer, Boris Spatsky, guys, they've already played the game 6,500 times in their head. No, by the time you make your second move, they know what your, your game plan is, and they have an effective strategy against it. So we think that that's sort of what you have to do. The more information you can get early on in your, in your care, the, the better off you are. So what do we test? We test the KI-67, the quantitative chromogranin. We do quantitative CD31 and factor VIII. We do drug resistance testing on the tumor. We do drug resistance testing on the tumor. Uh, on and, and against angiogenesis, against the blood vessel part of it. The good news is we do the, this last test for free. So if your insurance doesn't want to pay for free, that, that's okay with us too. The drug resistance testing, the, the company that we send it to, Precision uh, Therapeutics, uh, will send you three bills. If you don't pay it, they write it off and, and they never will send you another bill. The, the, the KI-67s and the chromogranins and synaptophysins, the insurance company pays for. Uh, again, we've already talked about the KI-67, the quantitative chromogranin, and the CD31. The angiogenesis model looks like this. I take a piece of your tumor. I, I take one gram of tumor and I chop it up into about a thousand pieces. 
Why a thousand pieces? Because as was suggested by Dr. Wolin, wouldn't it be nice if we could freeze some of your tumor and 10 years from now when a new therapy comes out, we can wake it up sort of like the, you know, the uh, old uh, science fiction story and bring it out of suspended animation and it's still alive, because it is. So we then overlay these things with drug and at the top we ask the easy question, does it grow or doesn't it grow? Yes or no, black or white? And then at the bottom what we do is we create a score and ask how much growth is there from the edge out this way and what percent of the circumference is involved with blood vessels. The guys in my lab call these my chia pets. <laughs> For you, I take your tumor and I ask three different things. What percent of wells begin to grow in the green? And then for each of the tumors, for each of the different therapies. So right here is RAD001. You wanted to know the effect of, of RAD001 if you took it? Well, there it is. What about other things? There's Gleevec. There's PTK, protein tyrosine kinase like SUTEP. There's its effect. And then you have things like 2-methoxyestradiol, which is uh, a, 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 another one that Dr. Uh, uh, <coughs> from Boston. Folkman and, and this company Entremed that did. And then there's some standard things like Taxol and Colchicine and then some biologic products like Chinese sweet leaf tea. The red lines represent how much the, each individual grew. This is yes or no, did it grow? This is how much it grew and if you put the green line with the red line you get the blue line and as you can see when it, when it has a good effect at blocking the beginnings of growing and a good effect on growth, then the overall effect is spectacular. But this tells you before you ever have to take a drug what a potential is that would, would give you the next step. What are we going to do? Well, we'll look at this and say, hmm, for you, RAD doesn't worth work, uh, work worth a darn. So we won't use RAD in you. And then let's look at PTK. Well, this is a different kind of analysis. Now I had 100 people that we treated their tumor with PTK, and we let all of their controls be the blue line. And then we put in the red dots, which were the effect of PTK. And as you can see, on the, the effect on how many begin to grow, PTK doesn't have much of an effect. But look at its effect on growth. Now this is much, much better than if you looked at the similar graph about RAD001. Well, what about the, that, uh, that uh, comparison of primary tumors, nodes, and livers? If you look at what is the most aggressive tumor in your body, your primary, your node, or your liver, I would have bet you the deed to my house it was the liver. But it's not, it's the lymph node, almost every time. If you look at KI-67, the, the yellow lines are things that are all the, the, the highest or, or the, the best. And as you can see, the things, if you look at the lymph node, the primary, and the liver met, <coughs> There are very, very few that the yellow line goes all the way across. More in KI-67 than in chromogranin. Notice in chromogranin you have one, two, three. Only three out of, of 30, or out of 13, that are all the same. If you look at synaptophysin, there's one, only one out of 13 that are all the same. And if you look at CD31, there's none. If you look at factor eight, there's, there's again no individual whose primary lymph node and liver all were the same. If you look at drug resistance testing in, in my angiogenesis assay, 
there are some things that do have tissues that are all the same. One of which is a, a compound called ga gallic acid. Turns out that craft food put gallic acid in your mayonnaise and in your, your salad dressing the whole decade of the 50s until they found out that there was a cheaper way and that's called benzoic acid. And if you look in your Coca-Cola can or your Coca-Cola bottle, benzoic acid is the, the food preservative. Anyhow, <clears throat> again, very few of the, the lymph nodes, the primaries, and the liver mets are all the same. But you can now look at each individual one and say, you, you, this tumor requires RAD, this tumor requires PTK, and this tumor requires Taxol. What we've not done is then try to combine that information and see if a combination therapy would be more effective than sing, single agent therapy. The FDA doesn't like this because there are no way, because you're different than your wife or, or your wife's different than your, your kids, for the FDA to control those kind of trials. If your primary tumor and your liver met inside your own belly are different, how are we ever going to compare you to the guy sitting next to you or the lady sitting next to you? What about chemotherapy? Again, look at the number that three out of three tissues match. Not very often. Again, 13 is the usual high number that we have tested. So again, what, what affects your primary tumor doesn't necessarily affect your lymph node, doesn't affect <coughs> your liver met. Well, what are the things that over the last decade we heard that the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors has tripled, but the survival I'm going to show you is better? Well, we're doing aggressive surgery. We're doing drugs like RAD001, PTK787, Sutent. We're doing high-dose octreotide, lanreotide. We're doing PRRT. We're doing better biomarkers. We're measuring them every three months. We're changing when things look like it's going bad earlier in the game. We're doing conferences like this where I get a chance to talk to you about what came out of my lab last week. And you're hearing it today before any journal has ever seen it, okay? So it, to that end, does coming to see Richard Warner, Dr. Wallen, or Dr. Waldering make a difference in your survival? Are the experts better than the guy at home who you've known since you've been six years old and who you love? He was a nice guy, but he ain't a neuroendocrine tumor expert. And I'm going to talk about that. We believe that it takes a village. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> Please, God, don't, don't strike me dead. <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> multimodality care. I am not a gastroenterologist. Dr. Wallen and Dr. Warner aren't surgeons. I'll bet that if we sit at this table, we have some disagreements. But when we come to an agreement, you get better care than if you come to Gene Waldering or Ed Wallen or Richard Warner by themselves. Because three heads truly are better than one. And I think that a Nets center is, is what takes and makes a difference. If you look at the, the NANETS, the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society's guideline paper that they put out in August of 2009, Ten. 10. This data, the SEER database, is what is the nationwide average, and that is the, the red line, or excuse me, the, the green line. Ours is the red line, and it's the survival, the median survival, if you come to our group, which is a multi-specialty, NETS-only type of group. And the answer is, if you look, there are 319 people with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor of the small bowel that have had 
care at, at our group. And there were 116 people that were in the SEER database. Our median survival of all these people, regardless of what therapy they got, was about double, or a little over double, than the SEER. And if you look at the 10-year survival, there's a 30% difference in survival. And these are all highly statistically significant. It says that experts do the job better than your family doc. That doesn't mean the family doc doesn't have a role. There's not one of us now that doesn't rely on the family doc to, to implement the plan that we make. And that, that's where it works. New products on the horizon, you, you probably, if you wa uh, watch the ACOR list and me talking, I talk a lot about black raspberry powder. The black raspberry powder is basically black raspberry fruit, freeze-dried, ground to 80 mesh. The seeds are taken out of it, and you have a powder that you make a cool water extract out of. You mix the powder in cool water, let it sit overnight, and then you strain the, the pulp out. We, we started using this uh, in a number of patients based on work by Dr. Gary Stoner at the Ohio State University. Dr. Stoner has two phase two trials, now one with Barrett's esophagus, the other with leukoplakia in the mouth. And uh, uh, the idea is, is that they used it as a chemo preventative and there's some handouts that Grace has somewhere up there. And where we're using it as more of a therapeutic. Again, the blue line represents people, tumor, they're untreated in our assay, and the dots are black raspberry versus the percent of wells that begin to grow. And as you can see, the two lines are parallel the, the raspberry has an effect, but some effect, people it has a great effect, and other people it has very little effect. But if you look at the overall effect, it now starts to clean up, and you can see that while this person here would not be a very good person to put on black raspberry, these kind of people here, it has a profound effect on the growth of their blood vessels. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thanks. Uh, wherever you live, there's somebody doing neuroendocrine tumor research, no matter where, where it is. Support those people. And remember, the Komen Foundation has raised a billion, that's with a B, a billion dollars for breast cancer research. I don't, I don't think we need a billion dollars, but we could need, you know, a Steve Jobs to come up with a couple of million. <laughs> Our tumors grow slow, so we don't have race for the cure. I'll be happy to crawl for the cure. <laughs>